<laughs> well, we're woken up now. Yeah. So how do I stand? I think my body needs to do this, not just my top half, but I want to not just turn my back to my distinguished elders. We're right with you. All right. So, okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is basically just say everything you've said, both of you, but in a slightly different frame and in a mashup way. Uh, I'm speaking from the Christian inner tradition. Please don't take anything that I'm about to say as orthodox Christianity or we'll all have an unhappy time. Uh, <laughs> nor is it even straight up contemplative Christianity, but it's informed by the wild men and women of the Eastern Orthodox tradition, Sufism, and some of these out pockets of Celtic and other mysticism where they've dived deep down the rabbit hole. So uh, in the traditions that I've been working on and in, this word being is not something you are. Usually in the philosophical tradition, being is sort of a synonym for existence. This thing has being. Uh, but in the inner tradition, being is something you have. It's an energy. It's a gathered presence. It's a mindful, fierce attentiveness in your body, grounded in your feet, centered lower than your head, in the region of your heart and your torso, here, feet deeply in contact with our mother, the earth, head in contact with the skies, but here, in the belly, in the heart. And in this configuration, not only are you truly present, but that presence is an energized presence. It communicates. It has a force. It beams out. It gives and receives it as its own kind of sonar. And a person who has being can walk into a room and say absolutely nothing. And everybody knows that person's there. Such is the force of being. All of your tradition knows it well. All of our tradition is almost clueless. Uh, <laughs> but we get it in our own sort of ways. So in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, it was implicitly understood that this being gathered, that the name they called for this was attention of the heart or in the heart. And they kept saying, you must bring your attention into your heart. Your mind must be within your heart. Come down, come down. And it's clear in the text, they're not just talking about a nice little attitude about, oh, let's just be in touch with our feelings. They mean at the physical level of sensation to be able to ground and shift your attention in this mid-reason as a whole alert presence. And when that happens, more energized, more alive, more awake, gradually a new operating system of perception kicks in. And the, real, the, real, the reason it hasn't kicked in earlier, the reason why we keep slipping back into the mind with its constant dualizing, is because that's the only being energy we have enough to run. It's not until we can gather our being in a more gathered presence that we have the higher, finer, more intense vibrational field that allows these other beautiful, mysterious, and more subtle and energized faculties of perception to kick in. When William Blake was talking about we are here on Earth a little while to learn to bear the beams of love, that's what he's talking about, those beams. But when that happens, when the mind comes into the heart, a different kind of knowingness happens. And you know, you can label it and you can borrow from, from Western versions of Eastern terminology and call it non-dual. That's the name has no force. 
It's an, a description by negation. In, in the traditions from which it comes, it's called sometimes seeing with the eye of the heart, seeing from the noose in the Greek, the, the noose being the eye of the heart. It's sometimes called contemplation. And contemplation doesn't mean resting in emptiness. The original definition was knowledge impregnated by love. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Try that in the halls of higher science. <laughs> you know. Knowledge impregnated by love. In other words, actually working in a whole different vibrational field. A, a way in which you're no longer using the mind, which unfortunately runs the, the egoic operating system, the middle hardwiring, is perception through differentiation. That's why we keep slipping back into dualism, because that's the way the mind perceives. It has to split the field to make inside, outside, me, it, subject, verb, as you said, do unto this, do unto that, uh, because that's the way, that's the operating system we run. Mm -hmm. And when we run that operating system, whose whole basic algorithm is perception <laughs> through separation, how in the living Hell are you going to perceive unity? Hmm. It outruns the operating system. You just can't do it because to, to perceive, to actually perceive unity, you have to perceive from unity. Hmm. And to try to perceive unity using the mind, meaning the rational facility, is like trying to take your old underwriter, Underwood typewriter if you could still remember what those are, and asking it to run the internet. <laughs> it can't do it. It outruns the operating system. It's not because of the sinful self-will of the typewriter. <laughs> it's just because it can't do unity with a programming that it relies on separation. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of shooting the mind, lobotomizing the mind. <laughs> It's a matter of bringing the mind into the heart so it entrains with this deeper field and in that knowledge, reaching out and actually perceiving by a kind of sonar, by a sympathetic vibrational intertwining, which allows you to get on the inside of everything. Suddenly, you see. And what you see is interbeing, okay? You see, first of all, horizontally. And what you see when you look out on that horizontal axis with the mind and the heart, with knowledge impregnated by love, grounded and present, is you really do see oneness directly. Not as a vicarious concept, not as an ideal called non-dualism, as an actual luminous web, everything connected to everything else within one glowing and very dynamic feedback field. That's what Jesus saw when he walked the planet as probably the first representative of this in the West and said, love your neighbor as yourself, not as, as much as yourself. We added as much as yourself in with that old typewriter operating program that says, I have to love me first and then I can love everybody else. Love your neighbor as yourself. Virtual particles, interchangeable within the field. OK? Can you do that? Not with the mind. Yes, with the mind and the heart. And when he told us that's most brilliant and difficult of his parables about the laborers in the vineyard, remember the guys that show up at 5.30 in the morning and get hired to work, and the guys that get show up 12 hours later, and when they get paid, they all get paid the same? You know, when you're in your mind, you will immediately say, it's not fair. <laughs> because what are you keeping track of? More and less, right? That's the mind. When you're in the heart, you see that what the landowner sees is a participational field 
in which being invited into the vineyard has nothing to do with getting his crops harvested or earning a living or beating out the other guys with the competitive edge. It has to do with creating a participational field. Why are you standing idle, he asks. And they say, because no one has hired us. You too. Go into the vineyard. Go into the field. Go into the collective inner being, Buddha nature, which is divine consciousness made manifest in form. And there dance and give and take and see and be. So we see horizontally, and I think that it's only when our mind is in the heart that we will ever see it. The reason I, I believe that Christianity has made a hypocrisy of itself for um, 2,000 years is because we keep trying to do this, this beautiful vision which is totally non-dual, totally fully interbeing oriented with a mind that separates, that perceives scarcity and lack and competition, so we wind up making fools of ourselves. But it's not because the message is wrong, it's because the message hasn't been lived yet, mm -hmm. except by these beautiful few that we remember as the ones who truly had being on this path and who passed it on. We also see, when we look through these eyes, we see worlds within worlds within worlds. When you were talking so beautifully about all these spirit worlds and things that, that these shifty-eyed white people didn't even think existed, Oh, they exist. Yes, and all the sacred traditions, wisdom traditions, have affirmed. They call them by different names. They call them the subtle world, the spirit world, the thin places, liminal spaces. My own languaging for it is the imaginal realm. And it's a realm that surrounds and envelops ours like a beautiful placenta enveloping the womb of our little Plymite planet. And in this, information and substance and nutrients are exchanged, and we receive help, and we give back help, and we find our place, and we transform the fruits of our lifetime into other things, things we're tasting here. Generosity, forbearance, truth, goodness, light, joy. And these become substances which nurture our planet. And when we fail to do that as human beings, you know, when instead what we put out into the planet is greed and isolation and separation and competition and, you know, we're putting poison into the planet, spiritual poison, which is as toxic and as causative as the lethal poisons we put in with our gas and our pollution and everything else. Mm -hmm. It is our human place when we understand the worlds within worlds to participate in the generation of these wonderful things. They're called in the Christian tradition the fruits of the spirit, which are our alchemical contribution to the life, the health, the beauty, of this wonderful body of interbeing that we are. And only in making that contribution can we find our place, our meaning, our wholeness, and our relatedness with everything. But we need these maps that are large enough to tell us that. You're not going to get it in traditional faith. You're not going to get it in traditional rational science. We need groups of practitioners like this that have the, the boldness to go back and find the new, old, indigenous wisdom maps, boldly shift them from an individual perspective which dominated the axial age into this new, genuinely higher collective vision. Imagine Buddha nature, salvation, emergent properties of the whole, not available in the individual self, except as we participate. Wonderful, wonderful way of thinking how we belong together. But these are just kind of little things I want to throw out with you to tease you with uh, and to affirm how what's being said in so many different ways and voices by so many gifted teachers from these traditions is really good, <coughs> true, profound, liberating reorientation for our own age. 
And what I'd like to do, if I can, uh, is to end my little segment of this by calling Paulette back up on the stage again. And uh, I hope they didn't take away your mic. There it is. And I want, I want us to sing that, the streams of my father's love, again. But I want you all to stand as you do it. And plant your feet on the ground like we did this morning, if you can remember back that early. And the text, the streams of my father's love flow daily through me from the holy fountain of life, from some great vast thing, to the seed, that's D at the end, the seed throughout the whole creation. There's this art of exchange, of giving and receiving, of nurturance, virtual horizontal that flows right through the awake human heart. And as we sing it this time, and we'll sing it twice, see if you can actually sense that in yourself. See if you can sense that even right here and now, you are part of a vast, cascading, dynamic web of exchange, whose final name is love. OK, Madeira. The streams of my father's love run daily through me. The streams of my father's love run daily through me. From the holy fountain of life to the sea throughout the whole creation. The streams of my mother's love run daily through me. The streams of my mother's love run daily through me. From the holy fountain of life to the sea throughout the whole creation. And may that seed bear fruit in each one of us and in our one cosmos. Thank you. Back to the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Cynthia, you spoke about um, the operating system that is, as Gerardo pointed to, so habitual mm -hmm. that divides and separates, and mostly that's what we're walking around in. Mm -hmm. um, and yet you created an experience for us in which maybe we had a taste of a different operating system. And there was a personal practice part of that involved, dropping our consciousness to our heart. And there was a collective practice of that involved. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to what you see as possible through gatherings like this, where there's a, an intentionality to change our habitual ways of perceiving and practice and a container held that supports this dropping. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I think I would say in the first place that, that we sometimes put the emphasis on the wrong thing and we kind of build ourselves, beat ourselves up and shame ourselves about, well, I, can't, I change my habit, change my habit. I think at the final analysis, it's, it's an energetic issue more than a moral issue, or mm. even, strictly speaking, a perceptual issue. Mm. Because until you have gathered and collected your presence sufficiently, you're going to run the old default system, because it runs at a lower energy. It's mm. all you can do. And so until, until a certain reservoir, certain critical threshold of beingness is generated and maintained, mm -hmm. it's impossible to escape the, the gravitational field of, of dualistic, egoic, middle, rational thinking. And the problem with our Western world is we've just said that that's the only thinking there is. We've, we've refused to acknowledge there's any other fields out there. 
But so I think that, that experiences like this, traditionally, this kind of energy boosting and gathering and, and centering has been done through sacred devotion and ritual. Mm -hmm. You know, that, and it, it happens even very quietly in meditation. And it happens really profoundly in some of the more exuberant rituals from Sufi turning to, you know, <laughs> sweat lodges to uh, all sorts of, all sorts of wonderful things. I've, I've, I got to go to uh, spend some time with the Bhutanese uh, Buddhists not long ago, and still playing on the vast horns and the banging of the drums and, and just something in the whole being wakes up. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in the collective gatherings with the intention uh, to essentially raise our energy field, not just to have a spiritual high, but to make something possible mm. in perception that we can remember and walk out of. You know, We can't disregard energy. We can't ris ris disregard the life force that runs through uh, our our connection with humanity, or our connection with all sentient beings. And we think we can cut ourselves off from the life force and just observe it and talk about it. We're fools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.